from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning, everyone. I'm Deanna Markham. I'm the Associate Librarian for Library Services, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this wonderful day. I know that uh, people are still getting coffee and catching up with old friends, but I think we'll start because we're trying to uh, do this program in a timely way, but we're so happy to see all of you here. This is an important day. It is this day that we recognize the 80th anniversary of the National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped. And it is an important day because we are recognizing a deserving audience of readers, the blind and the physically handicapped community that have been able to stay connected to their families and their communities in part because of this service. So I first want to congratulate the staff. I want to pay special tribute to Kurt Silke, who has led this program so ably uh, for so many years. I want to thank the standards community and its support of this program because, because of our work together, uh, this program has continued. And I want especially to thank the United States Congress for its funding of this program over the many years. The service that uh, we're celebrating today was first provided Braille books and has produced books on 33 and a third RPM records, open reel tape, and for more than 40 years, book cassettes and that was the uh, first version of digital talking books. During this year, the National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped completed its transition from the audio cassette to the digital talking book. Patrons may now hear their favorite recorded books on digital cartridges that use flash memory and are played on digital talking book machines. And you will, if you haven't had a chance to see these machines, you'll see them demonstrated at the end of this room later on. The readers may select from more than 300,000 book titles in more than 20 million copies of bestsellers, mysteries, history, classics, how-to books, many other genres. In other words, it's a first-class public library for the blind and physically handicapped communities. In addition, in keeping up with the digital age, uh, patrons may download talking books from the Braille and audio reading download, affectionately called BARD, which offers some 20,000 titles now. Patrons may also access music scores and materials in large print, braille, and music lessons on cassette. The National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped has served America by keeping blind and physically handicapped individuals connected to the world through reading. This program allows them to continue to expand their knowledge, enjoy the arts, and generally keep in step with their sighted peers. We are delighted that all of you have taken time to come here today and share in this celebration that, it, that celebrates an invaluable service. And I'm sure you're going to be inspired by the stories you're going to hear from our distinguished speakers today. And so we'll get on with the program now, and I'm delighted to introduce the first speaker, the 13th Librarian of Congress, Dr. James Billington. Thank you very much, and it really is a great 
pleasure to be here for this special occasion. I want to congratulate uh, on the part of everybody in the library and beyond the National Library Service of the Blind and Physically Handicapped, 80 years of service, and particularly for most recently, taking the monumental step of moving from cassette to digital technology. <clears throat> I might say that this is a one library program that even before I came to Washington, uh, let alone came to the library, I had a great affection for since my maternal grandmother lived with us for many years, late in her life, <clears throat> and uh, she died just two weeks short of her 105th birthday. And she always said to me that it was a talking book that added at least five, maybe 10 years to her life because she loved to read, <clears throat> but she was blind in her uh, late middle age, and these books uh, really were literally her lifeline. And because um, she loved to read, she loved to talk about reading, and she had that continuous flow. I might also say that among the many compliments you receive and hear about uh, for this program, I might just mention two. <clears throat> the late Saul Lenowitz, who's a great figure in Washington, had a granddaughter who was physically handicapped. That, that's the part of the service that uh, we maybe don't talk about so much, but um, uh, she was immensely helped. She was uh, in a hospital in Canada, more or less, for her life. But, she was enabled to re able to read despite <clears throat> virtual total paralysis because of the ingenuity um, of the service. And the other I might mention is uh, these are both uh, happen to be good personal friends, so I hear, heard about them on a regular basis was <clears throat> Father Ted Hesburgh, who's still alive, um, uh, and he's also blind, but he is a great user of and a fan of this service, and he said him himself that this has enabled him to continue his life of reading and reflection in a way that would have been possible without it. So <clears throat> if I don't get around to Taylor Street as much as I would like, uh, it's because I know that all of you have been working so hard to make this program uh, not only a historic success, but also an innovative one uh, in ways that are important to so many, many more people than just the few that I mentioned. <clears throat> now, digital talking book players bearing the Library of Congress label are entering the homes now of American citizens all across the country, in U.S. territories, and even abroad. I think it's something like uh, 24 million copies of talking books and braille books circulate to a readership of 700,000 and maybe more each year. Users are now experiencing the high quality sound multi-level navigation and the variable speed controls of digital talking books and players. So an 80-year-old uh, patron, for instance, of a Pittsburgh regional library recently wrote, and I'm quoting, my new digital talking book machine is a marvel of engineering design and simplicity, especially welcome at this time uh, when most new electronic devices seem to be made for rocket scientists or teenagers. <clears throat> I think that was a good one. Huh? Um, an 86-year-old widow who was without power for 29 hours was able to listen to her digital player during the whole out outage. <laughs> she says, I couldn't live without my books. It was the only thing that I could use. I listen all day long. My talking uh, book machine goes uh, wh wherever I go. As we are leading the world in offering digital talking books on cartridges and digital talking book players, NLS's transition into digital technology is also an important event in the world blind community. I mean, it is interesting, of course, that uh, actually blind people do read so much more actually than sighted people do. So this is just in terms of the actual usage of, of books and, and uh, talking, but whether they're talking or mute on the pages. Um, this, this is a statistic that I think not as many people are aware of as it should be. Anyhow, for eight decades, blind and physically handicapped people have depended on the program for braille and recorded books, first as records, then cassettes, <clears throat> now digital cartridges. Eligible patrons can now also, as uh, uh, Dr. Markham said, download audio books and magazines over the internet through the Braille and audio uh, reading download. That's barred service. I know I was out on the West Coast and they said, no, that's a subway service. And I said, 
I said, no, <laughs> it is a subway service. But this isn't the subway, this is mainstream for... <clears throat> uh, anyhow, <clears throat> um, a woman in Kentucky praises the service, saying, I'm quoting again, <clears throat> finally having instant access to thousands of books and magazines that I can download and read as desired rather than waiting and hoping for new books to come in the mail has been an incredible experience. I've recently started going back and reading a lot of the classics that I either hadn't read or didn't appreciate as a child, such as Charlotte's Web. After only a little over a year of using Bard, I can't imagine what I did without it. NLS is a vital part of its users' lives, deserves recognition for its contribution to American learning and culture. More and more, we're in an age of such great change that learning has to be lifelong and continuous. <clears throat> and I was happy to be able to cite these 80-year-olds. And since I've become very fond of a new slogan that's going around Washington, no octogenarians left behind. <laughs> <clears throat> um, anyhow, uh, the library uh, w does salute, as, as uh, Dr. Markham did, Kurt Silke, the man who's guided the National Library Service of the Blind and Physically Handicapped for so many years, and also the entire superb NLS staff for this great contribution to reading, a great contribution to America, and, and indeed the world. And so it's now uh, the time to turn it over to Robert Fistick, the Deputy Director of NLS, to do, introduce you to others on the program. But, with one final word of, of real gratitude on the part of, you heard from some of the ones who have written us, but the, for the many more, <clears throat> and we hear it all the time, wherever I go, this really is a, a noble, a wonderful cause. We're uh, happy to have so many of you here today and in tribute to 80 years of doing something wonderful. One time when I, I went, um, to Russia during the time of transition. And I went on their version of a talk, call-in talk radio show. And the first two questions before anything else were, how can we get your service for the blind in Russia? Wherever you go, this is an internationally famed program. It's a wonderful expression of the best in America. I congratulate you and Dr. Fistick, the Turk. The floor is yours with our thanks and gratitude to all of you who have made this 80 years one of the really great periods of national service. Thank you, Dr. Billington and Dr. Markham, and thank all of you for joining us in this most noteworthy occasion. The Talking Book and Braille program exists to ensure that everyone has access to the written word. Michael Hinkson is a writer, a patron, and a 9-11 survivor. He heads the Michael Hinkson Group, which trains corporations and organizations in inclusiveness and diversity issues and adaptive technology. His book, Thunderdog, A Blind Man, His Guide Dog, and The Triumph and Trust at Ground Zero is soon to be released. Mr. Hinkson will be followed by Nikki Kobe, who represents the thousands of youth who rely on Braille and talking books to keep up with their reading. Ms. Kobe is a blogger and the author of Nikki's Nook, Sharing the Journey. She is a senior majoring in social welfare at St. Catherine University in St. Paul, Minnesota. She represents the thousands of youth who rely on Braille and talking books to keep connected to their world. Michael, you're up. Dr. Fistick mentioned 9-11. I can categorically say that having been a patron of the services of NLS for many years prior to 9-11, having access to those services certainly helped to save my life on September 11th, and I'll explain why. I remember the first time I received a talking book <clears throat> from the library back in 1958. Our regional library was the Braille Institute of America in Los Angeles, California, and there I was 
in my home one summer day when our mail carrier brought a big box to the door. It seemed like a big box, a big flat box. And it turned out to contain a number of 33 and a third RPM records. And the title of the book was Dogs and Cats. And I don't remember anything about what it was about, <laughs> except that it had something to do with why dogs and cats fight. <clears throat> but between those records and Braille books, which I also started to receive from the library, I began to have the opportunity to imagine in ways that I never did before. The kind of imagination one can only get from reading. And through the rest of grammar school and on into high school, I read a variety of books, many that I never even ordered, but showed up for whatever reason. I, I remember, for example, when I was 14, receiving Dante's Inferno. That was a hell of a book if I ever read one. <laughs> Don't want to go there. <laughs> but even so, it was all about thinking of the imagination of these people who wrote. So a lot of fiction books with the imagination that that came out of those writers. But not only that, but reading biographies, autobiographies, more popular nonfiction literature, <clears throat> and reading about so many people who were doing so many creative things and constantly thinking about the fact that these people were doing what they did because they had visions. Whether it was fiction or nonfiction, people visioned. And so as I went on into college and then beyond, continuing to read some of the more famous authors when I was not reading textbooks. Mark Twain, my favorite author, Robert Heinlein, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, which I think is still the best science fiction book ever written, and a number of, of other texts of various kinds, thinking about the imagination that these authors had to create the kinds of things that they did, told me no matter what I did in life, I needed to imagine too. <clears throat> and so I went out into the world, went to work, and eventually I was asked to lead a team in the World Trade Center on, um, in, well, in New York, and our office was on the 78th floor of Tower One. Well, as soon as I knew I was going into the World Trade Center, knowing that there had been an attack on that building 10 years before, or eight years before, I started thinking about what would I do if I ever were confronted with an emergency? And almost daily, I imagined what I might do. And that was in large part because I had read so much about people and what if scenarios and, and dealing with management theory and how would you handle this emergency or that situation. It was something that was constantly on my mind so that when the events of September 11th actually occurred, in a sense it was almost second nature not to panic because I had created a mindset in myself that said, gotta work with whatever comes along. And I can't say that you can truly prepare for something like 9-11, but for me, I think I was as prepared as I could be in large part because I had the opportunity to read I was given a gift by NLS that no one else could ever provide. And from the time that Mr. Silkey took the reins of NLS, how this organization became a truly world-class library. It got to the point where I could get the books that I wanted rather than the ones that I didn't expect. I haven't reread Dante's Inferno. I really should, but, but the fact is that it's all about our gift that was given to us to imagine and to hunt the treasure of literature and to be able to do so many things that we could never do if we didn't have the opportunity to read. And that's what the NLS has given me over the past, well, since 1958, so that's a long time. <laughs> And I can only say thank you, NLS, and thank you for the 80 years of service that you have provided. 
Um, we look forward to being around in another 80 years to continue the process and, and to be here to celebrate again. Thank you all. Good morning. As a recipient of, the, of talking books for over 20 years, I am really pleased, just beyond words, to be here for this historic milestone. I'd like to focus on some of my favorite books, uh, which range from mysteries to romance to nonfiction accounts of healing and hope, and share a, a compelling story at least I think it's compelling, of how, how the Talking Book Program has literally changed my life. My favorite mysteries are written by Tess Gerritsen. Um, she has several books on, available in the program, and I would be hard-pressed to choose a favorite one, so I'm not going to try. In the romance category, I enjoy books by Danielle Steele, uh, Honor Thyself, Accident, and Amazing Grace are some of the favorites. Um, it's really wonderful for me to be able to discuss popular books like that with my friends. Um, in, in the nonfiction realm, I focus on books which inspire me, many of which talk about healing and living with disabilities and chronic illnesses. Uh, they include The Anatomy of Hope by Jerome Groupman, Life Disrupted, Cro Getting Real About Chronic Illness in Your 20s and 30s by Laurie Edwards, Miracles Happen by Brooke and Jean Ellison, and I Am the Central Park Jogger, A Story of Hope and Possibility by Tricia Miley. I'm an active member of the American Council of the Blind, and through that organization, I gain advocacy skills and meet wonderful people. One of the, them is Mr. Silkey. Through his help, my book was produced in talking book and braille formats, which allowed me to reach many readers who would not otherwise be able to read my book. My book, Nikki's Nook, Sharing the Journey, is about my journey as someone who, ha who is blind, a college student, and a person with chronic pain. I describe the challenges I face when bl my blindness and chronic illness collide. I will never forget the day I first read my, my own book in talking book format. While I had, had enjoyed the feel of the print book in my hand, what author doesn't, I hadn't actually been able to read it. And to hear a, a well-known narrator who I had been hearing for years reading my book, it almost brought tears to my eyes. I, I, in my book, I mentioned a fear let me back up here and explain that my book, like I said, talks about the chronic pain. Um, and in my book, I mentioned the fear of a surgical procedure which could possibly relieve my pain, but which I was not certain would be safe or accessible for me and or my guide dog, Julio. In essence, the surgery implants a device called a spinal cord stimulator near the spinal cord, as the name would suggest, to replace the pain signals with the tingling sensation. I feared 
I would not be able to operate the device without sight and that the tingling would interfere with my ability to feel the ground underneath my feet, an, an important task for someone with a guide dog. Through the talking book program, a man with my same nerve condition, experience with a guide dog and a spinal cord stimulator, read my book and contacted me by email. He alleviated my fear regarding the stimulator and we became friends. After eight years of treatment, my doctor told me my only option for pain relief was the stimulator. I would never have had the courage to undergo the procedure without the help of the talking book program. The surgery worked and for the first time in eight years, I have excellent pain control. Thanks to the talking book program, I can now focus on living like any other 24 year old. I can read some of the uh, some wonderful books and discuss them with my friends. The program has truly enhanced my life and I congratulate everyone on this amazing milestone. Thank you, Ms. Colby. Uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Dr. Maurer, the president of the National Federation of the, of the Blind. Dr. Mark Maurer is no stranger to this audience. Aside from leading the 50,000 member organization, Dr. Maurer advocates continually to ensure that people who are blind and have the same right to enjoy literacy and culture as their sighted peers. Please welcome Dr. Mark Maurer. I want to thank you all for welcoming me. Thank you, uh, Dr. Billington, uh, Dr. Markham, uh, Dr. Fistick, uh, Ruth Scoville. I uh, imagine you're a doctor too, but I haven't checked. Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty thick around here, the doctors. I note that my topic is listed here as access, education, and independence. These are subjects that I cover frequently. I do re lead an organization of better than 50,000 members in the United States, and so access, education, and independence are central to what we are worried about obtaining for all of us. This particular octogenarian, this program 80 years old, uh, is alive and well and in great health, and I congratulate uh, all of you for bringing it to this uh, condition. I have an opinion about how it happened and I wanted to share a word about that. I too have been a borrower in the program for a long time. I started at the age of nine. This was back in 1960. You will notice that Brandon Pickrell is with us today and I think he may be nine at the moment and he's been borrowing before I did so the chances are he'll be more literate uh, than I. And while we're sharing stories, I have read The uh, Inferno uh, <coughs> twice. Uh, I don't think I'll need to do it three times. <laughs> I came to be a part of the program because I wanted to find what there was that could possibly be for me. And the books provided a kind of a window into opportunity that we did not know, that we could not imagine, that at least I was hoping might have at least a part for me. And I had no idea whether it, any of it could come true. But it was beautiful to dream about it and to hope. For example, would I be in one of those colleges that I read about? Many of the books are about Princeton and Yale and. Then there are a few about the University of Notre Dame, and uh, Dr. Billington talked about Father Hesburg, who uh, I met recently again, less than a year ago, and he was the president of the university when I was there. When I came to meet people who were leaders in the blind communities, particularly Dr. Jernigan and Mr. Silkey, Dr. Jernigan pointed out that if I would read enough, I might become sufficiently educated to do some of the things that might make a difference. And the library was the place to get the books. 
Some of you have said that the library is an excellent program, and you're right. It is not just an excellent program, it is the excellent program. Some of you have said that it has done good work, and you're right. It hasn't done good work, it's done magnificent work. It is the envy of programs around the world. Dr. Billington's story about being in Russia and having people ask him about this program is reminiscent of many. I have traveled this world in a way that I never expected to be able to do, and I have found that this library is recognized everywhere in the world among blind people, and those who are not part of it wish fervently that they could be. For my part, I couldn't get books except through this library. This was the place to get them, and it was the only place. There are a few more places now, and there will be more, because access is one of the things we work on all the time. But this was the place to get the books, and if you wanted them, here is where you went. You could get some from some other services. Those services were and are limited. This one is much less limited, and this is where you can get the good things. I will tell you one, uh, well, two things more. One is this. These readers that we're about to hear from today, some of the most slept with people in the United States. <laughs> I use my book reading machine at night just before I'm going to sleep. I know that I'm going to be there, and I don't know whether it will give up or I will first. <laughs> the other thing is, leadership matters. Nothing happens without good leaders. When I was 22, Mr. Silkey came to direct the program, and he directed it until last week. A lot of things have happened in the program since the time he came to direct it. He has made the difference, and he has not done this alone, because one of the things that a good leader does is get about that leader, other people who have the spirit of leadership within them. The best leaders find a way to get great leaders to be part of the team. Mr. Silky did that. The envy of the world, the best library that you can find for the blind anywhere. I recognize that the Library of Congress also has the reputation for the best library in the world. Mr. Silkey, I'm sorry he's not here. He asked me to come. I agreed to come because he asked me. I love the library and its service. I admire the outstanding work of the people who made it possible. I look forward to helping build this program and giving it support from those who care about becoming literate and building things that never existed before we had the knowledge to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maurer. Dr. Billington, Dr. Markham, Dr. Maurer, distinguished guests, Library of Congress, and, and NLS staff, patrons, members of the press. This gathering commemorates the completion of eight decades of extraordinary effort by a dedicated and visionary company, the men and women who serve to make our service the finest in the world in providing books in Braille and recorded sound format to individuals who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise unable to use conventional print books. But this event is not just a birthday. It is also a celebration of the recent developments that have ushered us into the new era of alternative reading materials, digital books, and magazines of unprecedented artistic and technical quality, ease of use, and dependability. I'm going to try in five minutes or so to walk you through the 20 year journey that the NLS staff and patrons and everyone involved put together to create this digital effort. More than two decades ago, in 1990, NLS director Frank Kurt Silke convened a meeting in Dublin, Ireland of key figures in library service to, to the print disabled in the English speaking world. The representatives of NLS, the, Royal National Institute for the Blind of the United Kingdom, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind, the National Council of the Blind of Ireland, understood that the days of auto, analog audio tape, 
the medium by which all of their library materials were circulated were inev inevitably coming to an end. These librarians made a commitment to work together to exchange information and ideas in their search for a new and superior technology. The following year in 1991 in Moscow, Henry Paris, head of the NLS Materials Development Division, delivered a paper at the annual meeting of the International Federation of Library Associations in which he identified the requirements for a digital talking book system. This prescient report co-authored by Judy Dixon and Lloyd Rasmussen of our staff, touched on many key points that were to be foundational in the design of today's digital talking book player, which will be demonstrated to you later in this program. The NLS Technology Assessment and Research Program, known as TARP, was launched in 1992 under the auspices of our chief engineer at that time, John Cookson, who's here with us, to implement a structured evaluative process for assessing potential digital media and for developing a suitable playback device, including a consideration of commercial off-the-shelf players and researching key digital technologies such as speech compression, variable rate playback, and internet book distribution. At a 1993 TARP meeting, NLS Research and Development Officer Michael Moody proposed the use of solid state flash memory for the distribution of NLS talking books, noting the congruency between flash memory and the needs of NLS. It was a robust and reliable and it had high storage capacity. At the time, flash memory was prohibitively expensive. It cost $1,500 for 128 megabytes, just enough for one average talking book. But prices were predicted to fall dramatically within a decade, and indeed they have. Under the leadership of Brad Corman, Chief of the Materials Development Division, a group of NLS managers and technical experts who as the Digital Audio Development Committee met twice weekly through the late 90s and until the first years of the millennium to tackle the big questions, meet obstacles, and preempt anticipated problems. Later, over a five-year period starting in 2001, NLS established a digital long-term planning group that included librarians, staff, and patrons, representatives of the chiefs of state library organizations known as COSLA, and technical experts who, in sometimes exasperating detail, worked through the long-range ramifications of the digital transitions with respect to national distribution, machine storage, cataloging, and patron awareness. There would never have been a digital talking book without the development of the ANSI NISO standard, which was tirelessly shepherded through committee work by Michael Moody. Beginning work in 1997, the National Information Standards Organization gave it its approval in 2002 for the standard for the digital talking book ANSI NISO Z3986. This universal standard addresses the requirements of a range of agencies serving users with a wide variety of reading needs. Early in 2005, NLS contracted with Patel, a leading technology innovation firm, to design and develop a digital talking book playback machine. To ensure product accessibility for NLS patrons, experts in disability and technology issues were engaged as subcontractors on the project. Humanware, formerly known as uh, VisualAid, a leader in digital talking book technology, the National Federation of the Blind, the largest organization of blind persons in the United States with more than 50,000 members, and the Trace Research and Development Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which makes information technology and telecommunication systems accessible by people with disabilities. Following a long and arduous system design process and the acceptance of working prototype machines in a period of extensive usability testing with hundreds of active NLS patrons and network library staff members in both controlled and informal settings, probing the player and the book cartridge for any conceivable flaws, uses of price, the shape, the placement, the appearance, the ease of use of control buttons, player size and appearance, cartridge insertion, power cord insertion, uh, storage, and, and the use of the retractable handle, the audio characteristics were tested exclusively from speaker size and performance, tone and speed adjustments capability, and the programmed audio self-description provided by each control. Lessons learned were incorporated in leading the, uh, to NLS acceptance of the machine that is now in use. 
the digital talking system marks a stupendous leap beyond the cassette machines that have served us so well since the late 1960s. The digital player is significantly smaller and lighter than the cassette machine and easier to handle and control. The audio quality is superb. Tone and speed are easily adjustable. The machine remembers your place in the book, even if you remove the cartridge. And in the advanced model, you can set bookmarks and navigate to mark points in the book. And the cartridge is virtually indestructible with a projected 10-year lifespan. Manufacturing contracts were arranged in early 2008 and production of the new digital talking for the new digital talking system. Our quality assurance staff visited manufacturing startup lines in Japan to guarantee that the machines coming off the line met our rigorous specifications and random samples are checked continually at our Allentine, Pennsylvania arrival facility to ensure that there are no lapses in quality. We note with appropriate humility that the digital talking book machine failure rate is a remarkable eight one hundredths of one percent. It's incredible. <laughs> With the assembly of the present technical team, including Michael Katzman, head of the Materials Development Division, Michael Martys, our automation officer, along with John Bryant managing our complex braille and recorded book and magazine production operations, and quality assurance section led by Bob Norton, the digital system was ready to launch, and I have only acknowledged a few by name. The digital talking book, the NLS player, the internet download system that were once more than a dream are now in the hands of patrons who are by all accounts pleased beyond measure with the digital reading experience. We would be remiss if we did not mention our first digital undertaking, Web Braille, launched in 1999 and now serving thousands on the internet. Largely the brainchild of NLS Consumer Relations Officer Judy Dixon, here in front with us. Web, <laughs> Web Braille provides eligible Braille readers with direct access to books, magazines, and music materials and electronic Braille files for download or use online. NLS continues to add hundreds of new titles each year. Thank you, Judy. In closing, I want you to know that we rely on the active collaboration of NLS patrons to make our service what it is. They are seldom shy about making their voices heard, <laughs> and we listen to their calls and read their emails, responding to in whatever ways we can to meet their needs. Additionally, at NLS, we conduct two annual advisory group meetings that allow face-to-face -face interactions between NLS staff in Washington, with librarians and support personnel of the 121 libraries around the country that provide direct access to patrons with, and with patron representatives who are selected to speak for large regional constituencies. Represented in both of these meetings are the National Federation of the Blind and the American Council of the Blind, two key constituencies that have supported NLS through the years with their ideas, their enthusiasm, and when it has been warranted, their constructive criticism. <laughs> it is difficult to imagine our service without the active partnership of these estimable organizations. Today, we are optimistically looking forward, inaugurating outreach campaigns targeting both, targeting both the general public. Uh, there, there may be nearly three million blind, visually impaired, or physically handicapped individuals in our country who are eligible for the service but unaware of its existence, and to institutions, including schools, libraries, hospitals, nursing homes, retirement communities, and rehabilitation agencies. NLS currently serves around 28,000 institutions, but there are nearly 10 times that number that we plan to reach out to in the near future. As we look into the millennium, we see boundless possibilities for the expansion of resources for the blind blind and physically handicapped individuals. Universal access may indeed be finally within our grasp, and we at the National Library Service will continue to do our very best to work toward that ideal. Thank you. Our
Our next guests represent two different populations who rely on talking books. Since the program was signed into law, NLS worked tirelessly to fulfill its legal mandate to give veterans priority in the lending of books and machines. No one can speak to that effort better than Tom Miller, Executive Director of the Blinded Veterans Association. Mr. Miller has led B the VB BVA since 1994. It is his passion and goal to help blinded veterans rebuild their lives. Following Mr. Miller is Tom Galante, Vice President of Human Resources at the Bank of New York Mellon Corporation in, in Pittsburgh. The magna cum laude graduate of the University of, Par of Pittsburgh has been a patron since his youth. Please welcome first Tom Miller to the podium. Okay, thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, good morning, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fistick and Dr. Billington, Dr. Markham. Um, I'm uh, rarely at a loss for words, but following all the uh, previous speakers that have done such an eloquent job of describing the, the benefits of the National Library Service Talking Book Program. It, uh, not a whole lot left of it, uh, for me to say except congratulations to the Library of Congress and especially to National Library Service. Um, as they frequently say here on Capitol Hill, I would like to associate myself with the remarks of the prior speakers. Um, uh, and fortunately, I think it was uh, Dr. Markham that uh, expressed gratitude to the Congress of the United States for their support of the Talking Book Program over the years. Um, truly, uh, this is the National Library Service Talking Book Program is one of, in my view, one of the very few federal programs that really works and really has a positive impact on its constituents. So many of us have benefited for so many years um, having access to print. For those of us who lost our vision somewhat later in life, um, and of course my constituency, our constituency, our blinded veterans, um, the first thing that uh, you realize is once you lose your vision, you've lost your access to print, lost your ability to read, um, and that only adds to the trauma um, the other, I suppose, most significant loss is the loss of ability to drive. All of this relates to the loss of independence, and that is the one thing that's so critical for all of us who have lost our vision, whether um, from birth, early childhood, or somewhat later in life, to uh, traumatic, sudden and traumatic loss or age-related loss of vision. Um, uh, Dr. Fistig just mentioned um, the veteran's priority. Um, we are incredibly grateful for that, and it was never more um, adequately addressed than with this rollout of the Digital Talking Book Program. Blind veterans across the, the country are registered patrons with the National Library Service. We're the first to receive the digital playback equipment and access to the digital talking books. Um, I have heard nothing but very, very favorable, very positive comments about the uh, playback machine and uh, the, uh, the uh, flash uh, memory uh, cartridges. Um, it's just an incredible advancement. For some of us who are uh, electronically challenged, the digital talking book uh, machine is one that most anyone can operate independently with ease and uh, to enjoy their, uh, the books of their choice. Dr. Markham talked about the comprehensive nature of the collection of titles uh, offered uh, by the National Library Service, um, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, history, classics, self-help, how-to, magazines. Um, blind people across this nation have access to just about anything that they have an interest or desire to read. And they can receive these titles in a very timely way um, as the result of a very efficient and effective national network of cooperating libraries. Um, when I lost my vision in Vietnam, I, 
I'm originally from Detroit and was first introduced to the Talking Book Program at a VA Blind Rehabilitation Center. And when I returned home to Detroit, um, signed up with the uh, Talking Book Program there and had excellent service. I uh, worked for the VA in Detroit for six years and then transferred to the VA in Waco, Texas. And once again, got excellent service from the Cooperating Library there. And uh, no surprise, uh, that pattern has continued since I moved here to Washington, D.C. Um, the Martin Luther King Library here in the district uh, does an excellent job in uh, meeting the needs of its patrons and distributing books and machines when, when necessary. And I would like to, in addition to congratulating the Library of Congress and NLS, all the staff at NLS and uh, Dr. Maurer touched on a very, very critical um, issue, and that's leadership. And uh, Kurt Silke has done a marvelous job over the years in leading. In fact, I think he was here when this building was built. Um, uh, Kurt's vision and his ability to identify high quality professionals to assume leadership responsibilities within NLS. Um, there's been a lot of turnover in my 43 years um, of being a part of the Talking Book Program, but every time someone retires, there's always somebody ready to step in. There's never a loss in terms of quality of service, delivery of service, um, or vision in terms of where the program needs to go to meet the future needs of uh, our blind and visually impaired and physically handicapped Americans. Um, due to the uh, current conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq, where um, our country is creating a new generation of blind veterans, a generation that's much more technology savvy than those of us from uh, Vietnam, um, just to Give you a little flavor, they've talked about BARD and the uh, digital downloads and the access to uh, digital talking books. When I was going through blind rehabilitation in 1968, electric typewriters were just coming out. Uh, um, our new generation of blind veterans, all of them have grown up with computers in, in advanced technology and um, they're really into the BARD, the downloads, and all the technological advances. And it's difficult for an organization like ours, which is composed of World War II, Korea, Vietnam era veterans, uh, particularly the World War II and Korea era veterans, um, you know, up around 80 to 90 years of age, some of the technology is a, a little much. Um, and with the uh, lack of production of cassette, audio cassette tapes. Um, some of our older members are gonna have to learn some new technology if they wanna continue uh, access to print through uh, talking technology, whether it's um, through the uh, digital talking book program here at the library or, or other opportunities. But again, I congratulate the Library of Congress and especially the National Library Service, all of its staff um, Judy and Lloyd and, and so many of the folks on the staff have just done an incredible job. And I know I can speak for all the blinded veterans, visually impaired and blinded veterans across the country in expressing our gratitude. And, and the other um, thing that hasn't been mentioned um, is the vast array and network of, I was gonna use the word stable, but that might have a negative con connotation of volunteer, of narrators for the talking books. They just do a superb job. And I know um, uh, I order books frequently, not by the title or the subject, but by who the narrator is. Um, there are several who um, have been my favorites over the year, and I think one of them is gonna be on the program here shortly. But um, it's amazing the, the time and the energy and how they can bring talking books alive, bring characters alive, and as Michael and, and both uh, Mark mentioned, um, helping one's imagination and vision and help to visualize the printed word and the, uh, the text they're reading. They just do a fabulous job, and um, as 
Some of them tend to retire. They always seem to come up with others that just are incredible. So <clears throat> speaking for myself, a longtime patron, and for um, all visually impaired and blind veterans, congratulations and thank you so very, very much for such an incredible program. Good morning, I'm Tom Galanti, and um, I, I uh, can't uh, say much more about what all the other people have said, uh, except to say that uh, for me, uh, as a user of this program, uh, starting at about eight or nine years old, uh, to the current day, I think what this program has really done is helped me foster relationships. And, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, skipping through the childhood phase, but uh, I remember once in college when I started to realize the power of this program, I was reading the book The Godfather in my dorm room in college, and my roommate was there, and, and he was listening to it with me, um, and he was so impressed. A couple of other, we got a couple other friends came in, and all of a sudden there were 10 people in the room listening to The Godfather. And I said, do you think we ought to take this out to the lounge and where, you know, maybe we can all breathe a little bit, um, the size of college dorm rooms. But um, that really indicated the, the power and the quality of this program, which I, I think is tremendous, uh, as, as the others have said. Uh, the other thing that I think is really uh, important for me is uh, I got to use this program in working with my kids. And, uh, you know, uh, I have a son in college and a daughter in high school now. And um, in working with them when they were younger, reading books with them in Braille, but also listening. Um, and I think that their listening skills um, are really very good as a result of listening to materials with me. Now, my wife doesn't think so. She doesn't think any of us listen well. But as I point out to her, that's selective hearing. Um, and, and not anything to do with our listening skills. Um, but also, uh, you know, lots of, of, of funny stories. I, I uh, remember once, uh, it was just after college, I was dating someone and we were on a beach and uh, we were listening to one of those typical page turner, you know, beach books. And uh, there were some pretty uh, explicit uh, materials in, in that book. And uh, the, the woman who I was with said, please turn that down, people can hear it. And so I dutifully turned it down. And the people next to us said, turn it up! <laughs> we want to hear more. Um, I thought that was hilarious. She was appalled, but the, the NLS staff didn't know that that was a barometer to showing that that relationship had a very short life. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, also, when my son was in high school, he went through a stage where he said he was too cool for school, and he wasn't studying, and um, so we, we had a big confrontation about that, and some of you heard the story before, but uh, he said to me, I don't want to be like you. I don't want to be a tool working for the man. <laughs> and I hadn't heard that since like 1970, uh, <laughs> but... But I said to him, I said, well, you're going to read these books, and I'm going to read them with you. And as long as I have my recordings, brother, I am not the tool. I am the man. <laughs> so, well, he did get through high school, and he is in college, and, and all is not lost. Um, professionally, I mean, I can't tell you how many times the, the people in my regional library who provide these services have, have helped me get materials, uh, especially doing some of the work that uh, I, I've done internationally um, with, you know, with our company uh, moving into India and China and the Middle East and understanding things about those cultures and um, giving me some familiarity where, at least at a professional level, I could uh, pretend to know what I was talking about. Um, so, um, as well as actually getting some substance into my head. But I think really the, the critical thing for me and the most poignant piece of this is um, I lost my dad uh, about a year and a half ago. And he was a veteran in World War II. Uh, 
And uh, toward the end of his life, we started to listen to a lot of books together because uh, he, you know, worked up until he was 87, but uh, started to slow down after that, and he loved to read, but couldn't read very much um, anymore. He got tired quickly, so he liked to listen to books with me. We started to listen to a lot of books about World War II, and I remember particularly listening to the Herman Wolk books uh, that some of you may have read, um, the, the uh, War and Remembrance and the Winds of War books. And it was interesting because he started to tell me things about that happened to him in World War II that I never heard before. Because, of course, he was of that generation that you didn't talk about those kinds of things, that you came home from the war and you went to church and you went to work, and that's how you dealt with things. Um, but he really shared a lot of his experiences. He was in the Battle of the Bulge. He uh, had severe frozen feet to the point where his feet were almost amputated. Um, all, the, all the fear and anguish that he went through and the tough rehabilitation. And he, he was never able to talk about that until that time because we were reading those books and that allowed him to be in an environment where it was okay for him to talk about it. And you know, when you lose somebody, you really cherish the memories, and that's one of the things that I'll always remember, and this program really helped bring that forward. And finally, I want to say, you know, going back to that book about the, the Godfather, um, the, the um, book was read by a gentleman named Robert Reddick, um, and it's interesting because I was reading the book not too long ago with, uh, with my son, and there was a new version of it done by Robert O'Keefe, and um, that was a fine version. But when I listen to it, I'm thinking to myself, you know what, Vito Corleone doesn't sound like that, <laughs> because I'm thinking about the book, to Tom Miller's point, from the original reader that I'd heard. And although that was so long ago, um, you know, sometimes you get memories that really are very powerful, and the imagery of that is so powerful uh, that that's how I remembered those characters. And although the new one was fine, it just wasn't like the old one. And uh, uh, you're going to hear from one of our uh, great narrators shortly, but um, that's the power of having great narration, um, as well as you know, sharing, being able to share with people um, oral interpretation of literature, which you know, as a society, we don't do much now because we used to do a lot of reading aloud to each other and that's lost. So from my experience with my kids and my friends um, and uh, you know, um, my dad in particular, um, it was really great to still have that opportunity and this program allowed that to happen. Thank you. Our final speaker this morning Um, you know, talking book narrators are rock stars to NLS patrons. <laughs> it's really true. Martha Harmon Pardee has narrated more than 1,100 audiobooks. For the past 16 years, she has been a full-time narrator of audiobooks at Talking Book Publishers Incorporated in Denver, Colorado. In 2004, the American Foundation for the Blind presented her with the Alexander Scorby Award, and in 2003, the Canadian National Institute for the Blind recognized her with the Torgi Award. Both awards highlight the importance of talking books to blind, visually impaired, and print disabled readers. Please welcome Martha Harmon Pardee. <laughs> I'm still recovering from Dr. Maurer's uh, uh, comment about being sleeping with lots and lots of people. <laughs> it goes a long way to explaining why I'm so tired all the time, I suppose. <laughs> and I'm a rock star, too. No wonder I'm tired. <laughs> rock star who sleeps with a lot of people. OK. Um, I want to begin by thanking uh, Mr. Silky and everybody at NLS for inviting me to participate today. This is just such an honor. And um, also to Mr. Rudy Savage, my employer at Talking Book Publishers, for encouraging me to, to come. Um, it's, it's a huge honor to, in a sense, 
represent my fellow narrators, uh, some, of, some who I know firsthand, one very intimately, and um, others that I know through talking to patrons and um, through recording talking book topics. Um, as for my intimacy statement, that would refer to my husband, veteran narrator of 21 years, Eric Sandvold, um, who began his career here at the DC NLS studio. Um, he is, in fact, the reason I became a narrator. When we were first getting to know each other, I was intrigued by his job, a job I had never heard of before. And uh, he encouraged me to submit an audition tape. At the time, I thought it was sort of tantamount to, would you like to see my etchings? You know, you should really make a tape. I was like, well, OK, whatever. But, um, but I did. <laughs> and I did submit. And um, actually, before I was even approved um, or heard anything back, I signed on as a monitor at Talking Books um, because I was attracted by what was evident to me, a, a very worthwhile line of work um, <laughs> that didn't involve balancing a cash drawer at the drive through at Wells Fargo, <laughs> which I was not good at at all. Um, <laughs> eventually, fortunately for me, I was approved to read first magazines and then books. Um, I then bullied my way into more and more time in the recording booth until uh, in December of 1995, Mr. Savage extended an offer of full-time employment to me who, and I was extremely pregnant at the time, so that was good news. Um, in fact, I went into labor while I was reading a book <laughs> about the O.J. Simpson murder trial. Um, so. While I avidly support the idea of reading to children, you know, from conception on, <laughs> I hope it's the sound and cadence of the mother's voice and not the actual material that you're reading. Is, um, and I always have to mention, even though Eric doesn't like me to, but he's not here, so. Um, I, I, when I went into labor that night, he was also working. It was a very snowy January night, and I went and said, guess what? You know, it was our first time. And he said, and I quote, Okay, let me just finish recording this chapter. <laughs> so, <laughs> I did. Why? Well, I made no choice. Um, uh, as Mr. Fistig mentioned, I have recorded uh, over 1,100 books and hundreds of um, magazine articles. And I can't pretend that I connect with every book that I necessarily record, but I, um, I believe unconditionally in the right of all patrons to have access to a full array of reading materials. And so I'm, I'm very grateful uh, for the one small part I can play in that process. Um, we have two daughters, ages 15 and almost 13. Pray for me. Um, <laughs> and they now can tell if I'm narrating a book that involves any kind of child in peril scenario, because I call them more frequently <laughs> and remind them of all the you know, 2020 and Dateline, Stranger Danger information. Um, but without a doubt, I mean, there's no question what I enjoy most about my job is the unfortunately all too rare opportunities when I get to interact with um, subscribers and patrons. Um, the feedback and, and encouragement that I get on those occasions are, are so, it's just so generous and they really does <laughs> feed my soul and keep me going. Because you know, I spend a lot of time by myself in a little black room, and so it's nice to actually connect with people. Um, thanks to the internet, I've been able to develop some relationships with some of those people, and just am so lifted up when they send in emails. And um, in fact, when I was invited here, I put out an email to all my peeps and said, "Hey, I'm going to go do this thing. Quick question: You know, why is the NLS valuable to you?" I got lovely, lovely, heartfelt, and enthusiastic responses, but I'd like to share one with you. And this actually comes courtesy of um, Dick Wamser of Roseburg, Oregon. Hi, Martha. I sent your request to Elizabeth Shilhab. Elizabeth, I hope I said your name right. Um, who shall be 80 years old this September. She began attending the Texas School for the Blind in 1939, having residual sight at the time. I felt she certainly had the credentials for a reply which appears below in quotes, quote, talking books read on tape are valuable to me because at any given time, I can travel to any part of the world with full descriptions without the inconvenience of actually going there. 
become educated in matters of health, government, personal relationships, enjoy humor at its best, become engrossed in suspenseful, can't put it down fiction, all with the mere press of a button. It's difficult to enumerate in one sentence when a whole essay would only barely achieve it. Praises go to the inventor of these wonderful machines and to the talented and dedicated readers who throughout the years have made it a reality, Elizabeth. So, to Elizabeth and Pratt Smoot and NLS, I extend warmest 80th birthday wishes, my deepest gratitude for including me today in this wonderful anniversary. Thank you, Martha. Uh, I'd like just to take a moment to, um, to uh, introduce uh, the new acting director of NLS, um, Ruth Scoville. Ruth uh, has come to the library some years back uh, to uh, actually uh, uh, be the head of the uh, Culpeper facility, the motion picture uh, facility that the Hewitt Packard uh, uh, $175 million project. She was in charge of building the facility and um, taking care of everything. She's made an enormous contribution to the library so far. We're very pleased to, to uh, have Ruth as acting director while um, the library goes out to search for um, a new director. Um, and, and hopefully, uh, we'll stay for 38 years as Kurt did <laughs> and lead, lead uh, NLS into the future. I'd like to introduce to you now, Ruth Scovel. Uh, I'm gonna ask Michael Katzman, uh, who's the, our chief engineer and chief of the materials development division for a minute or two to step up and, and he's going to demonstrate very briefly here um, our new technology and then he's gonna be available over on your right, there's a table down there that shows some of our products and the new, new digital machines. If you wanna go down there at the end of the presentation and try them out and see them and so forth, they're available. But Michael's just gonna briefly uh, sh show you what's going on here and then we're gonna conclude. Well, this is, <coughs> sorry, this is the 80th anniversary of uh, President Hoover signing the uh, act that created NLS. Um, throughout that 80 years, we have gone through a series of technological changes. Uh, we started with Braille. Uh, we didn't have uh, talking books at the outset of the program. And at the end of the table, we have some uh, examples of some of the media that we have distributed over the years. We continue to produce Braille Braille books and Braille magazines. Braille is literacy uh, for our community. We, in addition to producing uh, audio materials and Braille materials, uh, the National Library Service uh, has a training pr uh, program where we certify and provide training materials for uh, Braille, and that's an important part of the program. I'm holding up a, uh, a, a gramophone record. Um, <coughs> NLS has always been looking at technology and how technology can assist our um, uh, patrons. This is a 33 gramophone record. Uh, back in the 30s, we were producing 33s, well before the general um, entertainment industry had moved to that technology. <laughs> of course, that advanced and uh, we moved to cassettes and finally, uh, well, not finally, we are at the moment on uh, flash memory. Um, thanks to Kurt's vision, we are um, on the forefront of distributing solid state uh, memory as media for um, our talking books. Uh, we provide it, the library service for everybody who cannot get service through regular libraries. And that means we're a free library service. So if you're out in the middle of America where Wi-Fi is not available, internet is not available, 3G is not available, you can't download books, you can get books um, through your local library uh, on flash memory. Uh, we're only part of the way 
into the future. The future is always somewhere off down the road. Um, we are looking at newer technology. Um, electronic books are now being mainstreamed, so there's a great opportunity to have accessible books born from the manufacturer, born from the publisher, and that's an important uh, aspect of, as we go in, uh, in the years ahead that um, we get those books already accessible um, and that all the books that are available to the sighted population are available to our patrons as well. We, we although it's a generous uh, appropriation from the Congress, we can only do a fraction of the books that are published in uh, the United States. Uh, and increasing that accessibility is important and technology will help us do that. Uh, I would be remiss if um, we didn't mention our partners in this program. As I say, the federal government is a generous uh, contributor to the program, providing the uh, financial means for us to produce these uh, wonderful machines and the media. Uh, but we can't do it without our local libraries, through, um, generally funded through state and local governments. Uh, they provide the personal service to our uh, over 700,000 patrons and that's the face of NLS to most people is the interaction with those dedicated librarians at over 135 regional and sub-regional libraries. We also qu can't do it without our partners in industry and in non-profits. All our books are recorded, um, well, Almost all our books are recorded by contractors, and they are non-profits and profit-making organisations. Uh, from, from, uh, from the outset of the Talking Book Program, the American Foundation for the Blind has been involved in the program. Sadly, um, they exited the program last year, but the um, American Printing House for the Blind, who've been in existence well longer than, than our 80 years, uh, of provided us with uh, talking books and braille and uh, talking book publishers in Denver has been a technological partner with NLS uh, from the gramophone record days uh, to the present and we appreciate all of our contractors. Um, we have machines that are made um, by contract and uh, they do a superb job in providing uh, us with materials that we can uh, provide to patrons. There's food at the end here, but if uh, you get uh, sick of the food or the food runs out, I'll be at the other end with some of the materials, be able, be able to demonstrate the features of the machine, and I encourage you to uh, come and have a look and get your hands on the braille and hands on the machine and uh, hear, hear what, how they sound. Thank you. Guess what? That concludes our presentation. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.